the other news, uh, the, the other news networks busted them for that. Yeah. Which I suppose was just fun, but <laughs> <laughs> but but it was, it's it's so interesting that the ideologies are are spinning so powerfully that that people would even you know uh, consciously lie. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah. There's a lot of conscious lying. <laughs> <sighs> Oh, that's what we're getting to. Okay. Oh, yes. This is good. Good setup. All right. Yeah. Um, do you think some of the like propaganda in the media is tied to this kind of um, obsession with like sensationalism in the in the news to kind of boost their ratings and, and make more money? Like, I think that could be a. Hey, Donald Trump's running for president. <laughs> <We're doing it>. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, in order for me to really unpack what's going on any further, I have to address, all right, the title, uh, the first slide, the, the title is, uh, again, Standing Up to Domination and Violence with a Console. All right, so what is the dom domination that sources the violence. Oh, what are we actually standing up to? And I want to make it clear that we are standing up to far more than police. And generally speaking, the police are not our enemies. And sometimes the police are our friends and that's their job. Sometimes even people who have had bad experiences with the police need the police. Mm -hmm. We're standing up, um, the, the, pol the police forces may be the first line of offense or offensiveness in many cases, but that's not the heart of the problem. So it's not a blue problem. It's more a green problem, and I'm not talking about the environment. <laughs> I think you can guess what I'm referring to. Talking about money. I'm talking about the hyper capitalistic approach we have to running the world. And what is used, what kind of ideology is used to manipulate public opinion. And I have a term that uh, I'd like to run by you that I see as the cause of much of our, our problem. And uh, three words, Christian Western supremacy. Um, the reason that I think that I, I can be a friend to, to people who are Jewish in our community is because in our conversations, there's a sense of safety because I recognize that there are inherent prom problems. In fact, to be more explicit, there is inherent anti-Semitism in structural Christianity. And it's not a new thing. And in fact, uh, while we want to sometimes look at uh, Nazi Germany as a repository of anti-Semitism. Those trains that went to Poland and Czechoslovakia to the death camps came from Italy and France. They came from other places. And people, sure they asked questions, but they didn't ask hard enough. Why are our neighbors leaving by force? And they were given lies, they were told, that uh, it's for their own good, it's for their own safety. There was and is in the Christian West an anti-Semitism problem 
The United States turned away shiploads of Jews who were in the same condition that Syrians are right now. But they came to the ports and were not allowed into our country. I'll let other people talk about Canada. <laughs> same thing. <coughs> And were it not for that anti-Semitism, the Holocaust <coughs> could not have happened. But were it not for the twisted view of Christianity, structural Christianity, that anti-Semitism would not have existed. And the thing that has to be addressed is how we allowed this to be. Now, Jewish people recognize much more completely, Jewish, especially Jewish religious scholars, recognize much more readily than Christian scholars how much anti-Semitism exists and is tolerated within Christianity. We have a long line of our most esteemed theologians who just so happen to be predominantly German. And not just theologians, you know, most prominently you look at Martin Luther. And somehow, think about this, in the Christian world, we can, we can talk blithely and we can quote Martin Luther without any compunction. This is not to say that everything Martin Luther did was bad, because a lot that he did was wonderful. He needed to exist. Jews even recognized that he needed to exist to stand up to some of the things that were going on in the structural church. But his anti-Semitism disflavors everything that he does, when it, especially when it comes to being Jewish. <coughs> but it's not just Martin Luther. I mean, I mean, we can quote, how is it that we can quote Martin Luther without even referencing the fact that there are people who died because of him? And it's not just the theologians, it's not just the Germans, but the Germans have a long line of them, but you read St. Thomas Aquinas, same thing. And it's not just theologians, but it's people in the Christian world. Like one of the great philosophers from Germany in the 20th century was Martin Heidegger, a member of the Nazi party himself. So how is it that in the part of the world that is most Christian, it is also most against Jews, more than any other place on the planet? So we have to take a, a look at the things that gave place to Western imperialism and colonialism. You know, a few, few months ago, I, my, my blog in, in Huffington Post was a challenge to someone that I really love and appreciate, and that's Pope Francis. But some of you know that just over a month ago, he canonized Junipero Serra. So now Serra is a, is a saint in the Catholic Church. And however a person might look at Serra, some might say it's justifiable, some might say it's not. Indigenous people around the world know a different side of the story, especially Californians. Now, I have friends who are, who, who are of Aboriginal descent in California, and they ask the question, okay, the Pope is canonizing Serra, who we see as an enemy, and he won't even come to California and do it. He's doing it in Washington. Is it that uncomfortable? He's already come to our soil. Is someone protecting him, so to speak? There were, there were protests in Washington, by the way. So, but, but, but even if a person can somehow conceivably justify the, the, the actions of Serra, here's the problem. The bigger problem is not him but that the Vatican can ignore the cries 
of indigenous people one more time. Yes. Okay, uh, not, maybe not everybody knows why <coughs> this was on fence. Yeah. What, what was it about Sarah and, and the mission okay. culture? Just an example, because, yeah, I'll yeah, give you an example. You have, you have, you, you, no, that's valid, okay? Well, for example, um, in the California missions, uh, there's like, we have our own Camino, El Camino Real, uh, and uh, the points on the Camino through, going through California are where missions were developed. And um, Sarah built the first nine of them, well, built, you know. And eight of those first nine have whipping posts in the courtyard for the discipline of the natives who, you know, needed discipline. What did they need discipline for? Well, they had been proselytized into Christianity, and if they, didn't, they weren't consistent in their faith, I mean, how would you like it if you didn't keep the rules of your church and that was, you know, the recourse that was taken? And where I live in Santa Barbara, I mean, we're known for, in the Santa Barbara Mission, for an uprising where the Chumash people rose up against the priests and took over the mission until the, the Spaniards came in with greater forces, greater guns and that kind of thing, and took it back. That doesn't sound like conversion, Christian conversion. But this is the thing that, uh, to the indigenous people in our part of the world, that's what they know about him. And so for me, it's not so much, because people can debate you know, the merits of Sarah and say, well, that's not true, and you know, what, what, whatever people do to try to believe their own version of history. For me, the heart of the problem is, is that you have these people who are saying, listen to us, and they're, they're being ignored. And listen, it's not just the Californians, but there is this, there is this invisible underground network of Aboriginal people, right? Mm -hmm. All over the world. You know, and, and, and you know, my, my Cree friends, I mean, I have a friend who comes down and she's visited our church, uh, Cheryl Bear. Uh, she knew about this. And she lives in Canada, you know, on the West Coast. Uh, people know about it. My, you know, Hawaiians know about it. Uh, Micronesians know about it. Samoans know about it. People all over the world, they know about it if they're Aboriginal. And it's as though the church has decided that, uh, you know, these people aren't worth listening to. So anyway, I, I hope I, is that good enough to kind of? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. So. Here's the thing, the West has colonized, and, 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 and this, is, this is significant. Um, I talked about the dance between Jews and, and, and Afri people of African descent. When I say it that way, it's because I'm talking about people more than in America, but people in Haiti and, and uh, people in the Bahamas and you know, people all over the world, all right. Um, there is this collaborative relationship because, um, because the civil rights movement gives energy to the Jewish community, and the reverse happens. The Jewish community gives life to the civil rights movement. It's always, I mean, it's been going on forever. They have fed each other because of the similarity of the experience. And, um, what the experience is, is not only have we been physically colonized and the land's been colonized, but our minds have been colonized. This is why alternative perspectives on American history. It's needed for more than American history. It's really needed for world history and specifically Western history. Um, we, we, we have this conversation uh, between blacks and Jews because uh, we, we have, we, uh, let me put it this way. If it weren't for the Holocaust, there would not have been the emergence of the civil rights movements in the 50s and 60s. I know people don't usually connect those, 
But when you think about it, you see, it's no brainer. Because up, to, up until World War II, the United States Armed Forces were segregated. And uh, the, uh, the African American community threatened to boycott the military in the middle of World War II. If there was no integration and the doors of opportunity, if they remain shut, and so President Truman gets credit for integrating the military, but he really didn't have a choice because the worst war that our country had ever faced was underway. Not only that, but Franklin Roosevelt before that, and this is, this is actually on film, he argues for better treatment for black people in America at that time, Negroes in America, he argued for better treatment because, he, because in his words, we don't have the moral authority to fight against Germans and Japanese people if we're treating them the way they're treating people. Yeah. Okay, I mean, then there's an obvious question to me is that I, I, I've never heard this connection, the yin and the yang, between the black and the Jewish communities before. But, but I mean, I'm just, I'm sure I'm not the only one to say, then how did this turn into the Palestinian disaster? Mm. How did? Well, it, I mean, how does a community that's so hurt turn around and hurt mm. so much? Okay. Bad? Now you're going in a whole different place. <laughs> but listen, there is a connection. Okay. Okay? Part two. <laughs> okay, let's see what time it is. <laughs> let's not go there. Okay, I'm not sorry. I just okay. <laughs> but there is a connection. And, and uh, uh, maybe, maybe we will look at that a little bit tomorrow. Okay. But I want to go back to, to Germany. Uh, you look at someone like Oscar Schindler, of all people. I mean, anybody seen Schindler's List? Right? Yeah. Okay. Or read? Um, if you read, if you if you read his his life, then you'll know that he was not, you know, your Sunday go to meet in Christian. <laughs> uh, if you know. In the eyes of Jews, he is he's the only Gentile uh, the, that uh, in uh, the only the only uh, Nazi rather that's in the uh, uh, that's counted among the righteous. You know, in Jerusalem, this place where they recognize the righteous among the nations, and Oscar Schindler's uh, there. I mean, he's recognized. He's memorialized there. All right, so. He's among the righteous among the nations. But if you would ask his wife if he was righteous, I don't think so. All right? So how is it that this guy, who is not a Christian, behaves more like Christians should be behaving? Well, we do have a redeeming figure, and there are others, but I want to bring up Dietrich Bonhoeffer, because he was probably at the heart of this. Uh, defense of, of Jewish people as a Christian. Um, but there would not have been a Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody read Dietrich Bonhoeffer? You, you know who he is, right? Anybody? Let me see hands. I just want to know because yeah. this doesn't mean anything if you never heard <laughs> right? Who's that? All right. So, But anyway, he's a German theologian who uh, eventually was executed by the SS. Uh, at, the, to, uh, at the end of World War II, towards the end of the war, uh, because of his stand uh, against uh, Adolf Hitler. And um, I wanted to, to share this, uh, because people don't, people don't tend to know this, because uh, there's a lot that we don't get in our seminaries. We don't, you know, we, you know, we as pastors don't get, because we get the official story many times. Um, but there, there's a side to Bonhoeffer that African American scholars are very aware of that most of the world doesn't know. You see, when uh, you know that, right? Yeah, I'm not sure yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, swing low. <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer lived in the states 
And he was teaching at Union Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. And he decided to attend Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, an African-American congregation, very vocal. This congregation was very vocal about civil rights. In his words, Bonhoeffer says he experienced his Christian conversion. He was already a theologian and a pastor. But he said, I experienced my Christian conversion in Abyssinian Baptist Church, where Dr. Adam, Cl Adam Clayton Powell, the first, was, was pastor. And eventually, he, he started teaching Sunday school there, and occasionally, Bonhoeffer preached there. And I, I want to share this. This is from the book, Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus, by Reggie Williams. Hey, Reggie, I'm promoting you. <laughs> okay. Puzzling paradoxes form a part of Bonhoeffer's legacy. He likely participated in a coup attempt against Hitler, radical and enigmatic to his colleagues. He gave up a bright future in the academy to struggle for the witness of the church against corrupting Nazi racism. As a blue-eyed, blonde, wealthy, educated, prototypical Aryan German man, he chose solidarity with racial outcasts in America and Germany, rather than a life of comfort within a society structured specifically to secure him privileges. His decisions to follow his convictions cost him his life. Family and friends had difficulty understanding what was driving Bonhoeffer's ostensibly insane behavior. But he was compelled into these seeming contradictions by his pursuit of meaningful Christian discipleship in a trying time by the call that Harlem's black Christ placed upon his emerging Christian identity as a young religion scholar. He chose to rely on the grace of God in active solidarity with suffering outcasts. Many decades after his murder, Bonhoeffer's voice remains relevant and influential. Considering the struggle he endured to be taken seriously by colleagues within the Confessing Church Movement, Confessing Church Movement uh, was the part of the church in Germany that emerged uh, to distinguish itself from official church, from, from the churches that capitulated to the Third Reich. Uh, his work, rather than that of many of his contemporaries, has been most influential and remains relevant in the Theological Academy and the church today. Some of his words and phrases have become part of our common Christian language, such as cheap grace, to describe a confession of faith without corresponding biblical obedience, and costly grace, to explain a lifestyle of obedience that actively corresponds with a confession of faith. Well, those are terms that Bonhoeffer uses prolifically, but he got them from his pastor in Harlem, uh, Dr. Powell. That Christianity was central to the problem of Christian apathy to Nazi racism. Instead, Bonhoeffer insisted that Christianity take seriously the life of Jesus, seeing discipleship as, a con as concrete historical action in obedience to the way of Jesus in Scripture and Christ's commandments as guidance for a daily life. The difference for Bonhoeffer between cheap grace and costly grace Bonhoeffer's radical Christian obedience to the point of death shows an inspirational witness of life committed to costly grace. Now, one of the things that, that Reggie um, points out uh, in the book as well is how when Bonhoeffer came back after, you know, he was in the States and he felt, um, he felt like the true Germany needed to be revealed. He said, what's going on there is not the real Germany. And so uh, he went there. But, he came back, and he came back to his church. And you know, um, often the story is told only from the perspective of Bonhoeffer. But you have to understand the the magnanimity of of Dr. Powell, who in a day where black people didn't go to white people's churches and white people didn't go to black people's churches, Dr. Powell was trying to broaden the thinking of his congregation by allowing a German to speak in a church where he looked like the people who mistreated them every day. Mm -hmm. But he had to broaden his thinking as well. Well, Bonhoeffer, uh, when he would go to, uh, to Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, uh, he found strength 
not just in the fact that he was invited, but there's a thing, there's a diamond, dynamism in, in the, the black church, especially of that era, that if you're preaching the truth, they'll get behind you, right? So if you're forlorn as a pastor, if you're beaten down as a theologian, if you're discouraged as a public speaker, you get in front of a black church and you just say a few words and they'll holler back at you. <laughs> Amen. Say that again. I'm with you. You ain't never been wrong. All kinds of stuff like that. <laughs> Let me tell you that if you, if you want to get inspired as a preacher, that's where you go. And so he was able to take his experiences in Harlem back to Germany again and keep on standing up. Well, I'm bringing all of this up to, to remind us, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, conclude for tonight in just a moment. I think I am. What time is it? 8.20. 8.20. Oh, I'm in no hurry. <laughs> That's a half hour of questions, no problem. Okay, so we're going to get, should I take the questions now or read what I was going to read? Read. 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 Okay. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. This is, this is from Jesus and the Disinherited. Howard Thurman was a professor at uh, Morehouse University, Morehouse <laughs> College at the time, and uh, this is where, uh, this was the place for male black leaders to go to school, especially in the religious world. And this is where Dr. King went to school, and this is where his father, Martin King uh, Sr., went to school. And they were taught by, by this man, and Dr. King never went anywhere without a copy of this particular book by Howard Thurman. And I want to read one of his experiences here. When I was a seminary student, I attended one of the great, great quadrennial conventions of the student volunteer movement. One afternoon, some 700 of us had a special group meeting at which a Korean girl was asked to talk to us about her impression of American education. It was an, it was an occasion to be remembered. The Korean student was very personable and somewhat diminutive. She came up to the edge of the platform and with what seemed to be obvious emotional strain, she said, you have asked me to talk with you about my impressions of American education, but there is only one thing that a Korean has any right to talk about, and that is freedom from Japan. For about 20 minutes, she made an impassioned plea from, for the freedom of her people, ending her speech with this sentence. If you see a little American boy and you ask him what he wants, he says, I want a penny to put in my bank, or to buy a whistle, or a piece of candy. But if you see a little Korean boy and you ask him what he wants, he says, I want freedom from Japan. In a way, this encapsulates the angst of struggling, dispossessed people all over the world in every period. And so, even though there are engagements with life on many levels, in the back of our minds is this quest for dignity. In the back of our minds, there is a quest for recognition of our humanity. So we can talk about many things and we can, you know, we, uh, uh, particularly in the context of our own country, we can talk about many things. We, you know, we can go out with our friends and we can talk about how the Kansas City Royals are beating the New York Nets. Or we can, you know, we can talk about how great enchiladas are. Uh, we talk about anything anybody else talks about. But really, in our country, it's never far from our consciousness that we want to be regarded as human beings. And we want to be treated the way that we deserve. I'm not going to touch on this tonight, but I have something tomorrow night that, um, no, I won't even, <laughs> I won't even <laughs> go there right now. But I do have another excerpt. and. Uh, for those who were here uh, yesterday afternoon, this is uh, something you've already heard. 
But it's important because it fits when I, when I talk to you about Christian Western colonialism or imperialism. Uh, this kind of helps to elucidate that. Dr. Thurman writes, I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times that I have heard a sermon on the meaning of religion, of Christianity, to the man who stands with his back against the wall. It is urgent that my meaning be clear. The masses of men live with their backs constantly against the wall. They are the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed. What does our religion say to them? The issue is not what it counsels them to do for others whose need may be greater, but what religion offers to meet their own needs. The search for an answer to this question is perhaps the most important religious quest of, of modern life. In the fall of 1935, I was serving as chairman of a delegation sent on a pilgrimage of friendship from the students of America to the students of India, Burma, and Ceylon. It was at a meeting in Ceylon that the whole crucial issue was pointed up to me in a way I can never forget. At the close of a talk before the Law College, University of Colombo, on civil disabilities under states, under states' rights in the United States, I was invited by the principal to have coffee. We drank our coffee in silence. After the service had been removed, he said to me, what are you doing over here? I know what the newspapers say about a pilgrimage of friendship and the rest, but that is not my question. What are you doing over here? This is what I mean. More than 300 years ago, your forefathers were taken from the western coast of Africa as slaves. The people who dealt in the slave traffic were Christians. One of your famous Christian hymn writers, Sir John Newton, made his money from the sale of slaves to the New World. He is the man who wrote, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds and Amazing Grace. There may be others, but these are the only ones I know. The name of one of the famous British slave vessels was Jesus. The men who bought the slaves were Christians. Christian ministers, quoting the Christian Apostle Paul, gave sanction of religion to the system of slavery. Some 70 years or more ago, you were freed by a man who was not a professing Christian, but was rather the spearhead of certain political, social, and economic forces, the significance of which he himself did not understand. During all the period since, you have lived in a Christian nation in which you are segregated, lynched, and burned. Even in the church, I understand, there is segregation. One of my many students who went to your country sent me a clipping telling about a Christian church in which the regular Sunday worship was interrupted so that many could join a mob against one of your fellows. When he had been caught and done to death, they came back to resume their worship of their Christian God. I am a Hindu. I do not understand. Here you are in my country, standing deep within the Christian faith and tradition, I do not wish to seem rude to you, but sir, I think you are a traitor to all the darker peoples of the earth. I'm wondering what you, an intelligent man, can say in defense of your position. Now, this is what a person of color who is a Christian has to face all the time. We have to justify our existence as Christians, knowing the legacy that Western Christian colonialism, Western Christian imperialism, has in the world. In the, in, the, in the 1940s and the 1950s, there was a heroin epidemic in New York, and black people, particularly young black men, were dying. Some people think it was intentional. That is debatable, that it was imposed upon them, but they were dying. You know what saved the black male community in Harlem? from heroin, from essential elimination. It was the nation of Islam. Because black Muslims went through Harlem and demanded not just abstinence from drugs, but sexual abstinence and abstinence from alcohol. 
they went into that community and they appealed to these young black men and gave them a sense of dignity. But the only way they could do it, because there were churches on every street corner that were not effective in dealing with this issue. The only way they could do it is they had to dissociate themselves from the Christian West and to tell them that you, my brother, are an African and you deserve to be treated with dignity. And if this society won't treat you with dignity, stand up for yourself and ignore them. Well, listen, it is, in that, it is with that kind of covering that these men survived. And to this day, we have an African-American community on the East Coast of the United States. So, if we're going to justify ourselves as Christians in the world, we have to go back and we have to look at our history. We cannot deny it. We cannot just lightheartedly quote people and employ their wisdom without standing up to their absence of wisdom with respect to the people who have been injured. Okay, so I'll stop there for now and ask anybody have questions or observations or whatever. <coughs> Yeah. Well, you talked at the beginning of the second half about the, the green part, the money, the hyper capitalism. And a, just a new thought, Don, I mean, I'm wondering whether you think this is crazy. Are, are, were you hinting that partly the, the Western Christian imperialistic force needs to remain racist? because it's all based on exploiting people of color around the world. So if they start treating people equally here in North America, how are they going to justify that? Like, is that yeah. connected in your I mind? Think, I think I know what you're asking. Well, my perception is that the, uh, the Christianity of it all is, it, it, created, uh, it created the imperialism, but the imperialism does not subscribe to the Christianity. It can't. So the imperialism controls the Christianity and uses the Christianity to control the minds of large numbers of people. So you can be a person who really has no conscience to speak of, but you will use other people's consciences who say they are Christians. And you will push your agenda on that basis. So you will say that your hypercapitalism <coughs> You know, your Adam Smith way of economics is Christian because it's part of our heritage. But, okay, I, I wasn't meaning to focus on the Christian part of that, so let's, let's scrap okay. that. So, but is it, in, in terms of the global economy now, like, do you think some people feel like the whole economic system of this world is so structured on exploiting people of color around the world that that, that would be threatened if if the West wasn't racist. <coughs> like, yes. you know, if there was yes. equality here, how do we keep justifying exploiting yeah. people of color all around the rest of the world? Do you okay, know I, mean? I see, no, I see that, yeah. Um, I think that there are, there are uh, powers that uh, understand that their status would be threatened, mm -hmm. but their status wouldn't be threatened so much as if the ordinary person was enlightened. Because I, I think those of us, the, the, as the man and woman on the street, the person who is not uh, you know, a, a billionaire uh, profiting uh, uh, through genocide and war and things like that, I think that if we were awakened to the realities en masse, that, that we would say this is wrong. We would say, uh, you know, we don't want it. In fact, we do quietly say this generally. But we don't say it enough because we are not convinced. Because it, we, we've, con, we've, uh, we've, con, uh, we've confused our religion with our economics. So we have confused religion. Don't we also fall under the hypnosis, the uh, opium of the masses? It's comfortable. If we're comfortable to buy things, we're comfortable to go to our church. Yeah. and say the prayers over and over and listen to the same sort of comfort. You, you feel good. You don't want concentration or con 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 
Confidence. Yeah, that's it. You don't want that. No. That's why I can't say it. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> Bad word. but I mean, that is a big part, I think, of the whole scheme or the whole what's underlying in the man on the street, the woman on the street, not speaking out. It. That's out of the comfort zone. That's okay. scary. Well, they simply don't know. Like earlier, Steve and I were saying, oh, we're going to this talk, and there was a customer, and she said, uh, there's there's racism? Yeah, and both of us are just like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, she was totally um, ignorant to the fact that racism existed in Canada. So that's difficult to like take. Yeah. <laughs> well, essentially, my thesis is um, that wherever there is structural Christianity, by default, there is racism. Mm -hmm. but, uh, why? Like, uh, why not just say structure? Why? What's Christianity got to do? That sounds like fun. But I mean, why? Why? Why blame it on on church? I think I see church as an important part of society too. But it's, to me, it seems like the, the economics and the politics uh, don't need the, the church for it for this to be a reality. Oh, I I agree. But the church gets. Manipulated, and as the church become, the, the church has to uh, thinks at least that it has to sustain sustain itself in a capitalistic way, and so we we are wed to we are wed systemically. Okay, I get that. because I, I feel that strongly myself. I, I, Time for a divorce. And <laughs> but you're talking about racism in the West. Yes, because racism isn't just based on. Christianity. Right. And the Burmese hate the Cambodians. Yes. Uh, it's a human thing. Koreans thing. hate the Japanese. Or an Indian machine. Okay. So you're just talking about racism here. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, and, 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 and even even those expressions of race uh, can arguably be connected to the imperialism that begins in the West to some extent. I don't agree with that. Okay. Well, you know, you don't have have to agree, but here's the way I'm thinking, all right? I'm thinking that the reason, one of the reasons that China is so closed as a society is because uh, when, when the UK could no longer make money because it ended the slave trade due to voices like William Wilberforce and, and such, they had to make money in other ways because of the hyper-capitalism uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of their system. And so what they did is they engaged in the opium trade, and they made an entire nation numb uh, with with heroin and such. And uh, and when the, they finally woke up from their numbness and identified what the problem was, they said, "No UK here anymore." And the same kind of thing happened in Bangladesh. And then there's uh, the, the the imperialism in India, where where finally they said, "We stand up." So. I think that this, you know, the West has just been more advanced, it's been more powerful, it's been industrial, it's been technological, and it hasn't managed it well. It's managed it in an imperialistic way. And if we could somehow pull it back and say, the reason that God gave us these gifts, well, I don't know if God gave them or somebody else, but the reason we, <laughs> the reason we have these gifts, the reason we have these gifts is to serve humanity, not to rape humanity. I think it could be a better world. And I think that most of us would prefer that. But there are some people who have so much at stake, at least in their minds, that they're unwilling to let the rest of us breathe. Really, we should all be saying, we can't breathe. I think it is, you've said a few times, it's less like we need to keep these people down and more of a paranoia of what if I lose my spot for the few on the top. You know, like, and that's, that's, an incredible amount of power. But see, you know, that's so true. And see, the thing is, is that we, we are conditioned to think that our security depends on somebody, else, somebody else's insecurity, when in fact that's not the case. But we are constantly being told that. Yeah. Uh, when you're using the term um, Christian Western supremacy, is that not just code for Christian white supremacy? Because aren't you equating in some ways Western being white? 
Okay, let me tell you why. I, I understand it, I get that, and I actually used to look at it that way. So yeah, I think there's much to be said for that. But here's the reason that I, I don't use the term uh, white supremacy so much. And it's because there are a number of people of color who have bought into that ideology. Of course. Okay? So, uh, and, you know, they, they feel like their security is, uh, is, is intertwined with white supremacy. They feel like uh, this is the system that works, and you know, and and I built my empire. You know, I'm an African American, or or I'm you know I'm Latino, or whatever I am. Uh, I built my empire within this empire. Right, but isn't that just hegemony at work? Oh yeah. So um, why can't somebody a uh, uh, black or Latino or whatever take on the white? Uh, ideas as their own. I mean, that's how hegemony works. Yeah, and they do. Um, but the second part I had to this question was with the rise of the um, South American Christians and the African Christians rising in, in large populations and the shrinking of the white Christian population, isn't there going to be some sort of sea change happening as far as... Oh, you reminded me, I forgot to mention. I always forget to mention something. Uh -oh. All right. But isn't that going to change yeah. the attitude of the church? And isn't Pope Francis part of that change coming from South America? Well, I think he's probably evidence of it. Yeah. But, but you, you, you remind me. Um, we, if it weren't for the Holocaust, I mentioned how there, we would not have seen the robustness of the civil rights movement in the wake of World War II, okay? Uh, but it's also, uh, it also accounts for, I'm talking about the Holocaust during World War II, I mean, what it did to Europe, what it, uh, it accounts for the receding of, of uh, the, the imperialism around the world. Mm -hmm. If it were not for, I mean, basically, Jews died for our sins, because, you, you know, <laughs> India ends up free, and then next thing you know, Ghana is free, and then Nigeria has its, you know, has its freedom. Uh, this, I, I, I cannot separate these. That um, that there was a there was an emergence of conscience, and yes, there was a breakdown of structure throughout Europe. Yeah, the economies were weak. So, but but the argument, I mean, it could be argued that yeah, but they benefited. I mean, certainly Belgium was benefiting from Congo and. France was benefiting from Rwanda and all of these things were going on. Uh, so it almost is inexplicable that, that these imperial powers would withdraw from places they were profiting from. But the, the elephant in the room is, is all of these Jews who lost their lives and now, and now are looking for refugee status on a continent that has already proved that they don't appreciate them. So the formation of the state of Israel is a complex idea. Okay, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but the formation of the state of Israel in some sense is a ghetto because Europe has never dealt with, with its anti-Semitism. Okay, so I want to leave that alone because I want to get your question. Uh, well, first of all, that's not my I just realized that this movement connects to like a whole bunch of other movements, and if this, if this lifts off, then like economics get reformed, like I was sharing with him, like the environment, a lot of cool things happen. My question is, um, and maybe you answered it, and I just missed it. Uh, when you're in with this movement in particular, what does that uh, do? You guys um, band together with indigenous people and other minorities, and is that something? Not necessarily like agreeing on this issue, but yeah. like trying to like move together to kind of unite as one voice because let's face it, the government just tries to ignore everybody. So if you like come together, so yeah. that's been my experience. All right, in, in in many ways, especially because well, we're talking younger people, and as Howard Zinn says, if you're going to be an activist, you better do it while you're in college because you'll be paying for your college the rest of your life and won't have time to be an activist. But, <laughs> oh, 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 uh, but here's the thing, <laughs> uh, they are conscious about people who are being oppressed. I'm not saying every college student, I'm just take, saying in general, the protest movements are represented 
uh, largely in many cases by college students or people that age. And, uh, and they, they do tend to be sensitive to people who are being mistreated, whoever they are. In my community, if, uh, for instance, we didn't know what the motivation was, found out after it happened that the guy was a white supremacist, but you know, there were four Indians who got, was it Indians? Uh, in, in, that got shot uh, near a college camp. They were all students. Uh, oh, yeah. I think South Carolina. I think it was North Carolina. North Carolina, all right. So they got, they got shot and killed. Uh, the next night on our campus, University of California, Santa Barbara, there was a vigil to memorialize them. They weren't in, wait, no. There were somebody, they were Muslim, I remember. Yeah. The Muslim, Muslim from? Dental, dental students, right? Yeah. January. Okay. So we, we, we had a vigil jointly, Black Lives Matter and other groups with uh, the Muslim Student Union. Um, on our campus. And that's really the spirit of what's going on. And you know, you observing again that movements really, uh, there's a synergy that happens. Uh, my view is, is that we would not have seen the energy between Occupy, you know, Occupy Wall Street, yeah. without the Arab Spring that took place, you know, right before that. And perhaps we wouldn't see the robustness of the Black Lives Matter movement without the Occupy movement. So it's people standing up. Uh, around the world, and what we need to do is realize that there is uh, th there is a real power in the people. We just keep telling ourselves that we can't do anything. We keep selling that to ourselves, and we have to reject that. So, I mean, I, I guess what I'd like to, from what you're saying, is you know, you say that um, Jews died for our sins. I like that concept because uh, you know is the, the pain of that moment opened up the shame and it could it had to be dealt with and so maybe it wasn't dealt with in all good ways but I guess the implication is that Freddie Gray uh, died for our sins you know that that uh, that people today like the girl who was pulled over when she's driving to her job mm -hmm. for a, 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 a brake light not working and ends up dead in a police cell you know that, that she died for our sins. That it's like it's like uh, this is almost like a moment like the civil rights movement when I was young. It feels now like like this is a new moment of consciousness that we get, get one step further towards what you're talking about yeah. because the suffering of these people is so visible. Yeah. So every, maybe every time suffering becomes visible, there's there's a, a there's a chance to try to create a fortress mentality and run from the truth and just keep doing business as usual, or there's a chance to open the doors to consciousness yeah. and to try to grow towards a better world. I love it. And, and you know what, I want to take that and I want to say to you know, our predominantly younger audience here, <coughs> not just because of you know, tuition and all of that, but while you have the energy and the strength and the fire, do it now. Just remember, Martin Luther King was 25 years old when he was installed as pastor of Dexville Baptist Church. Uh, Cesar Chavez was 26 years old when he began to organize his first union. Uh, Angela Davis was 26 years old as a, as a teacher, as a professor at UCLA. And uh, at, at a time when that was a rare thing. She was a professor there and she was uh, summarily dismissed and banned by Governor Ronald Reagan from ever teaching on a UC campus again. Shortly after that, she was in solitary confinement, but, but uh, then ultimately acquitted by an all-white jury. Uh, and yet, it's risky, but it's worth it. Uh, it's risky because you could end up dying early. Uh, Martin Luther King, he was 39 when he died. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was 39 when he died. In South Africa, Stephen Biko was 31 when he died. So when, when, when you look at people who make a difference, they really put their lives on the line, and it costs them, not all of them, you know, physically lose their lives. But real change requires some kind of courage where you go against